Cool. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Adapting for Our Future in the Face of Climate Risk, brought to you by Clear Risk. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join this event. My name is Jamal Ali, and I'm a Clear Risk sales engineer. So for anyone in the audience who might be unfamiliar with Clear Risk, we're a risk and claims software provider based here in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. So the goal of our solution is to enable success through risk optimization. We offer a comprehensive tool to help customers take control of the risk programs, providing visibility into all information relevant to claims, risk, and insurance. Data-driven technology is essential when facing the challenges of today's risk landscape. Clear Risk's cloud-based risk management system offers visibility into claims, incidents, policies, assets, transactions, contracts, and more. Streamline incident data collection, analyze information with custom reports and dashboards, and integrate with third-party systems and APIs, all from one centralized system. The risks are ever-evolving, and adaptation is key to sustainable survival and success. So, if you're a risk manager or executive leader at a large organization, Climate risk is likely climbing towards the top of your radar nowadays. The goal for today's session is to provide relevant educational content that you can apply in your careers. And this webinar really is for anyone who wants to learn how to take climate risk into their own hands and adapt their organization for a sustainable future. We're so excited to have an insightful and experienced panel of speakers presenting today. The first presenter we have here is Caitlin Garrison. So Caitlin is a PhD student here at Memorial University researching financial risks associated with climate change. She has a bachelor's degree in interdisciplinary studies and a master's in public health. Beyond climate change, her research experience spans numerous topics, including substance abuse, COVID-19, landfill management, and water pollution. Next up after that, we'll have a presentation from SUS Global COO, Alistair McGregor, and Growth Operations Manager, Jay Marwaha. Alistair is a CFA charter holder and has a master's degree in environmental economics with a 25-year career dedicated to financial and environmental risk management. First, as a hedge fund manager, he became aware of the financial impacts of a climate event on portfolio companies. He was, he, then he was COO and executive director for corporate ESG services at TrueCost, which is now S&P Sustainable One. Today, he uses, his, he uses the latest technology and machine learning to realize SUS Global's mission. Jay has supported clients in the space of data for the last seven years. He began his career at IHS Market, which is now S&P Global, where he assisted corporate clients in the financial services sector with navigating economics and country risk data sets. He joined SUS Global as Growth Ops Manager back in October, helping clients assess their physical climate risk and the best ways to incorporate it within their strategies and workflow. We're very lucky to have them here with us today to share their, their knowledge and experience. So today's session is going to focus on the following topics. We'll have an overview of physical and financial climate risks and their impact on insurance and risk management. We're also gonna have some suggested reform strategies and future direction to improve the sustainability of current risk and insurance practices. And then as well, we're gonna have a demonstration of climate analytics and APIs for finance and insurance managers with some case studies to back those up too. So before we dive into that, I just wanna go over a few different uh, housekeeping items. Because this is an online event, let me start out by outlining some of the engagement features that we have on this webinar platform. First of all, we encourage you to leave comments or reactions in the chat you'll see on the right of your screen. Feel free to introduce yourself. Let us know where you're joining us from. We'd love to hear it. Our marketing coordinator, Hind, will be in the chat moderating throughout the whole time, and she'll be happy to engage with you folks. A gentle reminder that your comments will be publicly visible to everyone in this room, both during and after the webinar. Our speakers are happy to answer any questions you have. Just uh, submit your questions by asking on the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. And if someone has a question that you really want to see answered live, you have the ability to upvote questions to push them further up in the priority list. We do have time allocated at the end for a Q&A, but if time runs short, we will reach out after the webinar and make sure everyone's questions do get answered. You'll also notice that we've added a few questions under the polls button on the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to participate in those throughout the session. As well, uh, the SEC's long-awaited guidance on climate risk disclosures in the U.S. was recently released, calling for uh, corporations to report their physical and transitional climate risks, impacts, and targets each year. SUS Global has actually prepared an article highlighting eight things you might have missed in the uh, SEC climate disclosure guidance and what you can do to get ready. To read the full article, you can click on the Get Prepared for Climate Risk button on the bottom of your screens. 
And last but not least, if you want, if you have to leave early or want to rewatch this webinar or share it with some colleagues, the link you use today will continue to host the recording of the event after it's over. Just sign back in and in the same way you did today and start watching. So on that note, I would like to invite our first presenter, Caitlin, to the stage. Thanks so much. Uh, is my mic on? Yeah, it looks like it is. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. So I am, while I get my screen sharing, I'm going to be talking a little a bit about some of the basics of climate risk and kind of what you guys can do to get prepared. So some of the, let me get situated. So some basic things you're going to be seeing as climate change progresses is particularly increasing infectious diseases. Um, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with some of the basics of this, but as we've all been living through COVID, but some of the most direct impacts we're going to be seeing is through uh, vector-borne diseases. So think Lyme disease, West Nile virus in North America, and that's actually going to be happening through expanding tick and mosquito habitats. So those are going to be moving further north into Canada. Um, and that's kind of already happening in some areas. So for health insurance, you're going to be seeing more claims in areas where you weren't previously. Uh, and it's also really directly linked to natural disasters because after a disaster, you're going to have more congregate living, water contamination, and those things are going to lead to water-based diseases. Um, and also, you're going to have adapting microorganisms that are going to be more adept to living in warmer climates. So these diseases before where they might not live as well in colder places are going to be spreading further. Um, and a less direct impact that I think people maybe not won't think as much about is some of the increasing pollution, spreading allergens, more UV exposure, under nutrition and just the chronic stress that we're all living through is gonna alter our immune systems and weaken them and leave us more susceptible to diseases. So all of these things we need to think about when we're thinking about how we're changing health insurance and the kind of burden that this is gonna place on our systems. Uh, I think the most direct Thing that people think about when they think about climate change and insurance and financing is the natural disasters. And it does, I think, have the most drastic effect. So as uh, surface temperatures rise, we're going to have a higher likelihood and more severe droughts and wildfires in arid regions. And this is kind of already happening, especially in California and British Columbia. But in addition to this, we're already going to be seeing some more evaporated water, particularly ocean water. And as these, as this water is evaporated over the oceans, this is going to fuel our hurricanes more. And so those storms are going to change their patterns. And so they're going to come inland more. So areas before where they wouldn't have to worry as much about tropical storms are going to be seeing them more frequently. Uh, and these storms are also going to be more intense. So where, as before, you'd have barrier islands kind of break those storms, that it might not be as effective. Uh, and also, there's going to be some more rainfall and more flooding. <laughs> so all of this kind of leads up to this question of why is adaptation necessary, which I think is the big kind of crux of this webinar. So we are already seeing a one degree level of warming for climate change. And that's kind of what this left image here is what you're seeing. So this top bit is the temperature changes that have already been documented by scientists. And this bottom is the precipitation levels. And you'll see that these changes aren't universal throughout the globe. So different regions are impacted differently, which is why it's really important for you to look at your local region's risk levels. And adaptation is going to be necessary because even if we make all of these changes and adaptations, there's already going to be uh, there's already going to be these kinds of changes happening. So even if we slow climate change, even if we stop things, uh, there's already going to be these storms. So if we limit our warming to 1.5 degrees, which requires us to peak our carbon emissions by 2025, so just a few more years, and become carbon neutral by 2050, uh, we will still have uh, about 4.1 extreme heat events every decade, whereas pre-industrialization, we were having one event every decade. So it's going to require us to restructure some of our predictions for extreme weather events. Additionally, 
if we keep this warming to under 1.5 degrees, we'll be able to prevent an ice sheet uh, collapse, which will keep our sea level rise to one meter versus 10 meters. But notice how I'm not saying that it's going to stop these events. So we're looking at four events versus five or one meter versus 10 meters. We're still looking at catastrophes. Um, if we are unable to keep the 1.5 degree limits, we're looking at regions of the planet becoming uninhabitable. So at these middle degrees, we've got two degree warming and four degree warming. Regions of the planet around the equatorial and Arctic regions are going to become uninhabitable, either through storms or extreme weather. And so I would like to take a look at kind of what happens to our insurance system already. So over the past few decades in Canada, so our insurance and property and casualty insurance has been rising since the 1990s. And the average deductibles for health insurance since, the, since about 2010 has been coming up. And what I think kind of leads to this is following an event, um, people and individuals don't typically have the financial power to recover after a disaster. And there are lots of barriers that lead to this. So typically under insurance, language barriers, computer literacy, time. Um, and so the initial financial recovery is typically going to come from local governments, nonprofit, those types of situations. And so the available of rapid insurance payments is going to directly impact the community-wide economic impact. So how drastically, how drastic is the economic impact going to be for a community and how quickly are they going to be able to bounce back? But despite all of these gaps, countries that do have high levels of insurance do see economic growth after a disaster. So as we see these higher level of disasters and natural disasters um, and they're more severe, it's important to look at how we see these nonprofit sector interactions and these gaps and how we interact with them. And that leads me to talk about donor fatigue because recently in the past few decades, we've seen the nonprofit sector get really taxed by the increasing cost of these events. So, and this is most directly seen with wildfires, but you can kind of see it with any type of cyclical event. So this top graph here shows the cost associated with wildfires in the United States since about the 80s. And you'll see that the cost really drastically starts jumping up in about 2000. Um, <laughs> and a lot of this is really directly associated with media coverage. So this bottom graph is an, is, um, an example of the campfire in 2018 and how it was covered in the media. So the way the nonprofit sector works is donations come in typically how the media coverage is working. So with the campfire, the media coverage dropped off about two weeks before the actual recovery effort started. So their donations stopped before people actually needed them to kind of rebuild. And this is the problem that we're seeing as these events kind of come up in frequency and start overlapping is people are getting less money needed and they don't have the finances, the finances that they need to recover. And this is a particular concern for uninsurable risks like floods where this nonprofit is their main source of recovery or the government, the government resources are their main source. And this has led researchers and other scientists to call into question the reliance that we have on the nonprofit sector. <clears throat> So some current suggestions from other scientists are to establish or improve different collaborative relationships with local governments between the private sector. This could look like subsidized premiums, publicly funded reinsurance programs, but ultimately creating a shared responsibility of recovery um, and creating more of a community engagement with insurance companies, as well as risk layering and increased uh, reinsurance. <coughs> and uh, creating sustainable investments. So really making sure that the investments that insurance companies and companies are making are going back into their communities and are really uh, <laughs> ensuring that they are working for the betterment of sustainability and climate change. There's also a big talk into restructuring insurance schemes to account for changing event patterns. So really looking at events that were probably low probability before and reevaluating them into these uh, restructured. So for extreme heat, for example, before it was once at every decade, 
uh, whereas now it'll probably be four times a decade or maybe five times a decade. So really doing that math. Uh, also looking to climate risks specific products, risk, mit risk mitigation in addition to risk transference. And uh, there's some research into index-based microinsurance, but not much at the moment. So I think the low probability is a good way to go. Uh, some future directions for research, really integrating data into risk management, which I think uh, we're going to talk about a bit later. It's, it's really where the future is going, um, as well as managing and preventing uninsurable risks. And some feasibility studies are necessary. All of this is really theoretical at the moment, so it's, it's all very new. As well as establishing the insurance sector's role in the larger climate adaptation initiatives. So it really is a piece of the larger puzzle. Yeah, and I think that's all I got. So thank you guys. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, that was an excellent presentation. It's going to be a great segue into our second pre presentation for today. So please join me in welcoming Jay and Alistair here to the stage. Right. Um, I'm Alistair McGregor. I'm the uh, COO of SUS Global, taking the risk out of climate data. Uh, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Jay Mawaha. So really delighted to be here. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you, wherever you are. So what we'll be talking about today, first of all, Caitlin's introduction was tremendous for what we're going to be talking about. Really good way of introducing the macro context of climate risk and, and analysis and, and why it's needed. So we're going to start off by demystifying climate risk analysis for business use. Um, we're going to talk about integrating into your workflows and some of the challenges with those. Uh, and then we'll look at asset level climate risk and specifically how it pertains to company operations. Uh, we'll have a quick look at supply chains and climate, climate risk in supply chains. We'll talk about the accessibility of data and then finally, uh, we will finish up with a case study looking at private equity. And that sounds like a lot, but we will move through it uh, swiftly. So first of all, what are climate risks in a business context and what are the key inputs into uh, climate risk analysis? So you always start, well, you don't have to, but good climate risk analysis starts with um, uh, the global climate models. Uh, and there are over 70 of these. We use the latest collection, and these are really incredibly powerful models. They're created by the likes of NASA uh, and the UK Met Office, the world's leading universities. Um, and then you can augment that data with other geospatial data, such as uh, land cover, for example, which has a big impact on uh, the risk of wildfire, flooding, heat waves. You can also use satellite observations and to see what's actually happening and how that uh, how that relates to what the models say should be happening. And using machine learning, you can bias correct those models. Now, of course, to be relevant, you need an asset location, uh, and the more specific, the better. Um, so you need, uh, for example, a set of coordinates or a zip code. And then finally, to make that relevant for a business context, you need to um, understand the financial impact or at least some business uh, impact coefficient. So at SUS Global, we work across the entire spectrum of business and finance. Um, we, in, including working with some of the, the world's biggest market intelligence providers, but the, the, we come across a common challenge, and that challenge is that uh, integrating climate data into existing workflows uh, is difficult, and I'll come to that in a second. On the, if we work through this flow here, on, on the left-hand side, uh, there is tremendous pressure from investors and regulators growing around the world. In fact, most large economies now either have some kind of mandatory climate risk reporting or it's in, in the work. So, very high profile, of course, is what the SEC is talking about, and, and, and that is likely 
to come in or it's planned to come in in 2023 2024 it might be delayed a bit but it's coming for sure um and then there are other pressures as well and caitlin touched on some of those um but consumer pressure customer pressure uh, other stakeholder pressure ngo pressure um but for the person tasked in an organization tasked with dealing with um or managing and uh, measuring climate risks it's a real problem uh, and um, uh, the reason for that is that climate science is incredibly complex the outputs of climate models are not in business metrics uh, so uh, they can't easily be integrated uh, and of course even for a sort of mid-sized organization you're probably talking in hundreds of locations uh, if your investor if your investor private equity firm re or, or larger, then you might be talking about hundreds of thousands of locations. So at SUS Global, we take that complexity and, and turn it into business in, intelligence, which enables the uh, measurement, management, and reporting uh, in a really confident way on those climate risks. And ultimately, of course, the reason you do this is because it delivers uh, increased business value. So I'm going to look at some specifics here. So he, this is a an actual. Um, uh, corporate in the US uh, and each of these dots represents an asset location uh, of that business so the dots when they're green mean low risk amber mean uh, moderate risk and red mean high risk uh, and here we're specifically looking at flood risk um, and now there is good historic flood risk data there's no doubt about that and you may well ask that question but the thing is that flood risk is increasing over time. So on the left-hand side, if you see these charts here, uh, the, um, you can see the historic incidences, the, the frequency and severity of those and the length of time, the, the duration of those different flood risks. On the right-hand side, we see, according to our climate models and analytics, how those risks are increasing over time. Now, to the eagle-eyed amongst you, you'll notice that that's quite a long time horizon. And although it's on a steady upward trend, you might say, wow, there's not a material increase for another 15, 20 years. Um, and that may well be so, but climate change is not evolving in a linear way. It's going to be um, sporadic and severe at times. And of course, asset prices and insurance premiums will, will discount this well in advance of it becoming uh, generally accepted um, as an as a, as a ongoing and immediate risk. So there we were looking at flood, but of course there's multiple hazards. Uh, we cover seven climate hazards so that's global. So here we're looking at wildfire, I've added in here. And then we can also add in cyclones, again, looking at the same locations and the same level of risk. And this is the same business, but now we're looking globally. So this is a fairly sort of mid to large uh, business uh, and they have assets as you can see all over the world um, distribution offices manufacturing sites and you can see that actually most of their operational risk uh, lies outside of uh, north america um, and also you'll notice the, the the volume of assets as well and the, the potential complexity and this is all before you get to supply chains so i'm just going to touch on supply chains a moment now now probably admittedly not entirely from climate risk but probably the biggest single um uh, supply chain disruption that we've seen in the last few years has been in semiconductors uh there were multiple reasons not least a global pandemic uh impacting supply and also impacting demand as we bought more uh, physical goods um, but climate risk did play a role in Taiwan. We had droughts, Malaysia, we had floods and cyclones. And in the US, we actually had an extreme cold that all impacted the operation of, um, of uh, semiconductor manufacturing facilities. And the direct cost of those climate impacts was relatively still high. We're talking about a billion dollars probably in total. But this is absolutely dwarfed by the scale of the downstream um, uh, economic costs of that chip shortage. So the U.S. Department of Commerce estimates that was $240 billion uh, in the U.S. in 2021 alone. So obviously this is at a macro, in a macro context, but if you look um, across the, um, 
across the supply chain as an, as an individual con uh, downstream consumer of a product, uh, you can, it gives you an idea of the potential uh, value at risk. And of course, it's not all semiconductors are a very easy one to point to, but it, it, it can influence any particular widget you might be buying from a particular manufacturer. And there's been numerous other examples. So how do we turn complex science into business intelligence? Um, so I'm going to, repeating slightly what I talked about earlier, but we start with these really powerful, complex global climate models created by these, um, these institutions, uh, peer-reviewed. Uh, the problem from a business intelligence point of view is that they're not very granular, they're often not global, uh, and they're very difficult to understand. So unless you're a climate scientist, uh, they're, they're fairly impenetrable. So we start with those, and our first thing we do to augment them is we layer over other geospatial data. So I mentioned, for example, land cover. Um, the really powerful thing that we do is we use satellite observations to see what's happened in real time. Uh, and then using that data, we can feed it into our machine learning algorithms and bias correct the models, which not only improves their accuracy, but it also improves their resolution. And we can also factor in other geospatial data sets as well. So the output of this is those seven climate risk exposures. And risk exposure is measured both in the probability of an event, uh, but also obviously the severity of the event. And we do this across multiple climate scenarios. So um, those climate scenarios that Caitlin touched on, so 1.5 degree, 2.5 degree, 4 degree, et cetera. And we do this for any location uh, on Earth. Now, great data is great, but it's not much use if you can't access it easily. So we, um, we make it available via uh, our API, or if those that don't want to integrate with our API can also access it via our really intuitive dashboard. So at this point, I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Jay Mawaha. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to the presentation. And um, I'll take it here with a, with a private equity case study that we have. So how can climate data support private equity in investment decisions, risk management, and ESG reporting? I'll be running through a case study with BC Partners, a private equity firm that used our Climate Explorer platform to evaluate, over, evaluate 500 geolocations, asset sites across the globe. Their key finding was that 11% of the companies within their sample portfolio that they used were exposed to high physical climate risk. BC Partners is a British private equity firm, one of the largest in Europe with 40 billion assets under $40 billion assets under management, including companies with global operations. Their strategy tends to avoid high risk sectors and have in recent years focused on strengthening risk management practices um, on ESG exposure. A thought leader in understanding how climate risk could affect their portfolios, BC Partners used the TCFD, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, bit of a mouthful, framework to um, conduct the climate risk analysis under different climate scenarios and time horizons. The TCFD is an industry leading framework and the SEC climate disclosures, which were announced in uh, March, um, which are currently going through public commentary, have made reference to the future utilization uh, of including the TCFD within their climate disclosures. The reason being it helps companies structure climate risk and opportunities with focus on four key areas, governance, strategy, risk management, metrics and targets. Within the TCFD, there is scope to understand physical climate risks and scenario analysis, and this is where CSUS can assist. It's important to note that climate scenarios help to understand how physical risk will change with different temp temperature rises, as Caitlin and Alistair have both mentioned. Um, and the ability to assess uh, multiple time horizons can support investment decisions and risk mitigation methods. In order to conduct a scan of global locations, well, where on earth do you begin? Um, that's with CES Global. So we've simplified climate science data, building on the latest IPCC CMIT-6 climate models, enhancing those models with additional data layers such as geospatial and satellite data. And as Alistair mentioned, making, those, making that data available via our API or dashboard. 
Through BC partners using our Climate Explorer dashboard, they were able to find out that out of the 27 companies that they looked into, three of those companies were exposed to high physical climate risk. When reviewing under different climate scenarios and time horizons as well. This has allowed BC partners to enhance their climate resilience planning and in their words, do their bit to avoid a climate related business disaster. How? Well, informing key decision makers, uh, for example, if there's a chance of severe flood, can companies put in flood defenses? Do their operations need to be moved in the long term? Um, help guidance towards their sort of climate mitigation and uh, adaptation decisions, um, and also prioritize area of concern through value at risk and uh, aggregate risk metrics. Some other applications within the private equity space and that we have supported in also in the last uh, few months is ESG due diligence. So when acquiring firms, do you know, do you know the extent to climate risk potentials um, of acquisitions? Finding climate risk awareness within a current portfolio, uh, strengthening sort of defenses, as I mentioned, or opportunities um, and mitigating any risks. Um, which goes again into decision making and also ESG reporting. So the rise of TCFD, the SEC announcement in the US on climate disclosures, um, we're seeing more and more sort of world governments pushing the, the sort of climate risk agenda, um, which then in a sense puts, puts on pressure to investors to disclose. So we here at SIS Global support clients in really understanding their climate risk landscape to assess mitigation strategies, investment decisions and ESG reporting. Perfect, thank you so much, Jay, for sharing that. We're now gonna open the floor to, uh, to questions. <clears throat> so to start off this q and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll give it a, the first question here. So I'm going to ask the panel for their thoughts on how the subject matter today relates to the proposed new SEC regulations that are going to require public corporations to report on climate risks. Sure, I can I can give a bit of insight into that. So with the SEC um, announcement, what we're seeing is more uh, the need for more um, data, essentially, physical risk data, um, emissions and transition risk data. So, and that helps in terms of building strategy around understanding the landscape for a company to uh, understand essentially what, what, what they're going to be exposed to and how to mitigate that and move forward. Um, so I think some of the big kind of things to take from that is really the need for real good data essentially and the ability to then translate that into actionable business decisions too um so we've seen a lot of sort of firms uh, trying to understand sort of what data is available how they can go about in assessing that um and moving forward also then the the use of say the tcfd framework getting knowledge around how that how that works within a company uh, how to how to navigate that kind of space as well is is another area that we're seeing sort of uh, interest into since the announcement of the sec guidance perfect thanks jay and we got one from the audience there actually as well so lauren here has asked uh, as climate risk management becomes more regulated what can organizations and investors do to avoid perpetuating greenwashing? Uh, what can be done on the organizational level versus the, inv the individual consumer level? Yeah, I can tackle that one. And just to add on the SEC one, I think it's great for transparency. And I think that adds on to the dream greenwashing. Bit, I think just making sure when on an individual level, when you're purchasing anything, look for transparency in the companies. If you're not sure where the money's going or where your products have come from, I usually see that as a red flag. And as an on an organizational level, the same as well. If you're transparent about where you're getting your products, what you're doing with the money, how you're ensuring sustainability, you're going to be on the right track. And I think if you on just like a value level if you think about maybe why you're thinking about greenwashing is it more of a marketing thing or like are you being environmentally conscious for a marketing decision or is it actually to be environmentally conscious you'll stay on the right track even if it's a slip like even if you make slip ups you'll be better suited i think mm -hmm. 
If I could just maybe add a comment on the SEC as well, uh, Jamal. Um, I think I think it will really it will help um, companies be be prepared and do this in a kind of systematic, methodical way. Uh, I think one of the things that in speaking to to particular legal professionals in the US over the last few weeks is the extent to which the SEC will look backward as well. And whilst there may well be a delay to the launch date, um, everyone is accepting that this is going ahead. So those businesses that are prepared, well, it might seem more more of an investment, um, it will actually uh, will pay off over the, the medium term when uh, companies are, are prepared for the um, uh, the rollout of, of regulation and, and as Jay touched on it it's it, there are obviously immediate benefits this isn't this this is being catalyzed in many respects by the need for disclosures but many companies have been reporting and, and, and or measuring and managing both their uh, emissions uh, their transition risks and their physical climate risks for 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 decades so um, it's just accelerating a process that were, was already was already underway. Thanks. Yeah. So some, really, there's a clear early adopter advantage here for the companies that are kind of doing this before governments step in and essentially enforce it. It looks like we have one more question uh, came in there as well. Yep. We have Lauren asking, what are some immediate actions that organizations can take to minimize the impact of the most cl critical climate risks? Shall I, I start with that one? I mean, I mean, it's very sector specific, um, depending on on what your um, your assets are, the relevance of operations versus supply chain. So, I mean, I think with any environmental risk uh, process, uh, you should always start with some kind of materiality assessment and look across all your operations and supply chains. Uh, and obviously, some of your inputs may be soft commodities, for example, which have has a whole another whole level of climate risk. So, um, I think the it it's the the answer is it depends. Um, and but the starting point is to understand where those risks are, um, and then therefore, if you understand where the risks are, you can understand whether the the the, the adaptation or divestment or the the best approach um, to to managing those risks. Yeah, I would just kind of echo what Alistair is saying. There's not going to be for any type of climate adaptation or risk preparedness a one size fits all because it's going to vary so much between geography and sector. Um, so it's really going to take your own personal businesses or individual data and um, information. So just taking data and education and Well, if there is no more questions at the moment, we can give you all some time back there. Um, I would like to thank you all again, uh, our panelists today, for your excellent insights. And I would like to encourage everybody in the audience today as well to click on that Get Prepared for Climate Risk button there to learn more. And if there is no other questions there, um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us here today. And I hope you all have a great one. Thanks for having us, Jamal. And thanks, everyone, for joining.